You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Welcome to the Bitter Medicine Podcast, where it's all about black empowerment. Our show focuses on black news and entertainment, arts, science, economics, history, people, and strategies that uplift, empower, and motivate Africans within the diaspora. And now, your host, whose favorite color is black, Goku. Welcome back to the Better Medicine Podcast. I'm your host, Koku. Um, today's show, well, before we get into today's show, let me give the customary free biz shout out. Uh, free business shout out goes to Stephanie Renee's Salon, located at 1614 West Main Street in Kalamazoo, Michigan. The zip code there is 49006. You can reach Stephanie Renee's Salon at 269 459 6535. That's 269 269- Four five nine six five three five. Uh, they're conveniently located inside Cali Beauty. Next up is Amy Marie. dot Maven. dot com. That's A M Y M A R I E. dot M A Y V E N N. dot com. Um, they also deal in natural hair care products. Uh, their mission is to provide high-quality products with unparalleled uh, shopping experience, um, world-class technology and hair care products, etc. You can find them at amymarie.maven.com. Next up is uh, Melanated Conscious Society. You heard me uh, talking to Kepra L. on my podcast several weeks back. Uh, you can find them at www.melanatedconsciousociety.com. Uh, MelanatedConsciousSociety.com is a mentor, black community empowerment organization in Jacksonville, Florida. Make sure to follow them on um, all social media platforms. And if you have a skill or talent related to uh, marketing, like social media marketing or graphics, or whatever you can do, or, or you know, uh, reach out to them. And offer your assistance. You know, it's for a good cause. It's it's organizing for our people. Uh, lastly, uh, Glenna Davis on uh, Twitter. Uh, she could be reached at g l e n n a e r n at gmail dot com. Uh, I'll just read what she sent me. She said, "Hello, thanks for your reply. I'm Glenna Davis, an L A based registered nurse, author of a critically acclaimed memoir. Yet here I stand." creator and chief nurse of Nays Vision, a healthcare media empire where we provide the healthcare education and planning to bridge the gaps of knowledge between discriminated, disadvantaged people facing employment discrimination and the healthcare industry, resulting in having a strategic plan with the medical support they need to no longer be victimized, merchandised, or marginalized by the system. I currently have two products available for your listeners. Number one is the memoir, and number two, a free health checklist. So, guys, uh, if you're listening, make sure to reach out to Glenna Davis. Once again, her email address is G-L-E-N-N-A-E-R-N at gmail.com. I also want you guys to take a listen to this. Greetings, family. In case you didn't know, the Bitter Medicine Podcast hosts an online book club. Every month, we will select a book to inspire the Bitter Medicine Podcast listening audience to read along together. At the end of the month, we will host a call-in show book discussion live on YouTube. This is a great dynamic way for readers to not only enjoy a book, but also have others to bounce ideas off of. It's been said that if you want to hide anything from black people, put it in a book. Do not allow this to be true anymore. Head over to www.bittermedicineblogs.com and subscribe to our newsletter for important updates. Do that today. 
Join our reading collective today and empower yourselves, your family, and your community. Peace. And that brings us to today's discussion, which is a book club uh, book review. We're talking about The Destruction of Black Civilization by Chancellor Williams. And joining me is Carl Hezekiah. Carl, are you there? I'm here. Uh, How are you? I'm good, sir. Good to have you on again. Sorry about last week. I had a, a bit of a medical procedure that I had to attend to, so... I'm glad to be here, glad to have you on the show today, and I'm glad that we are discussing this amazing book today. I'm glad to hear you're doing okay. Thank you. Carl, um, this book, uh, and you know, I didn't share this with you before, but I'll share it with you now. Um, this book, we, we're taking a, a different approach to the review um, because this book has something like 16 or 17 chapters in it. And if we were to do a chapter-by-chapter chapter review of this book, we'll be here for the next eight hours. Um, this book is, you know, like a lot of the other books we've covered, very dense material. It's an interesting read, but the truth of the matter is, at least for me, I'll speak for myself and not for you, um, some parts of the book gets kind of monotonous um, uh -huh. because we see the same patterns of destruction of the black civilization over and over and over again just just change the location so I, I wanted to avoid the monotony of telling the same story of uh blacks having you know left egypt um landed in certain areas of africa built up civilizations here comes the white guy the arab what have you destroys it and then we're back on the run again so i didn't want to you know, rehash that over and over and over. Instead, I wanted to focus on Chancellor Williams's, uh, I think it's eight questions, eight fundamental questions yeah. he wanted to answer. Can you tell the listening audience what the questions were? Do you have that in front of you? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, I'm turning to that page in the book. So what he is talking about is the view from the bridge. And he's what he's saying is that now that we now that he summed up the interpretation of history over 6,000 years with African people touching from prehistoric to almost to the current day, uh, he wants to talk about what are the, what's the outlook and these are some of the questions, some of the issues that he felt as a historian should be addressed. And, um, something that he is, something he really wants to bring out the folly of integration um, and I'm just going to read what he says. He says, what is the view from the bridge? The outlook is grim for the black people of the world. There is no bright tomorrow. Mm. The blacks may continue to live in their dream world of singing, dancing, marching, ho praying, and hoping because of the deluding signs of what looks like victories, still trusting in the ultimate justice of the white man. But a thousand years hence, their descendants will be substantially where the race was a thousand years before. For the white people, still masters of the world, do not have to yield. They have never changed their real attitude toward black people during all the passing centuries, and there is absolutely nothing upon which to base the belief they will change in the centuries to come. Concessions on some demands, yes. Expediency dictates this. Noting that the black masses accept as leaders any and all Negroes who hold important positions, the whites who control these positions directly or indirectly, actually determine who the leaders of blacks shall be as independent black organizations emerge. Hmm. So when he, when he says, um, there's some uh, facts that he mentions. Uh, first facts he says is that white America is definitely and unalterably opposed to integration and amalgamation of the two races. That's the first fact that he points out in his, uh, in the, uh, these eight questions. Mm -hmm. A uh, second question is black America, the masses are equally opposed to the integration and amalgamation of the races. Uh, part three, uh, fact number three, the drive for more amount, more and more amalgamation is, and always has been spearheaded by those colors who maintain a separatist society within the black race and who are not, and have never have been identified with the black masses. 
Uh, fact number four, since everyone knows there are millions of light-skinned members of the race, some are as white as any Caucasian who are African in spirit and are devoted to the race as anyone else. The crucial question is how long will this other white-oriented group be allowed to block the real progress of the race? Um, fact number five is those who speak seek for admittance in, within to white society should not be criticized or condemned. As previously stated, it is an individual matter of choice and is both natural and right if their blood call is to the white race than the black. But they cannot be allowed to use their imposed leadership positions to browbeat all black Americans into the line of march toward white society. And the drive, uh, number six, it says the drive of integration is most damnable on one score alone. It is a deliberate and stepped-up attack of, on the most significant aspects of the black of the black revolution in the sixties. The revolt that revolt was a reversal in the psychology of the race, a quest for its lost manhood, by first emancipating the mind from the over bondage of over Caucasian Caucasianization, and to establish forever the real basis of equality with the rest of mankind from the rediscovered pages of a history that was lost, because it reveals a long line of giants unsurpassed by any people on earth. Um just going to paraphrase fact number seven. They're absolutely right um, about the general lack of quality education in black schools, the very schools of which they are the principal supervisors and teachers, but their minds are and interests are elsewhere. Hmm. And also, um, he says the millions of, of um, Africans of mixed blood have always been steadfast and devoted to the race know that when the white man gives them a preferential status above the unmixed, but always blow himself, he does so to maintain the myth of superior white blood. The redemption, the redemption of the sin of African blood is proportionate to the amount of white blood in their veins. So these are the eight facts that, uh, that Chancellor Williams is mentioning in his, uh, towards the end of the book after his studies of these African civilizations. And, what led to their decline, their rise, their, their fall, and subsequent rise and fall of these several African states mentioned in this study. So, Carl, our lines were a little bit crossed in that, um, and, and I think for, I think it turns out to be for good reason, um, the view from the bridge is a kind of summing up of a plan for, for black struggle. Um, which mm -hmm. which Dr. Williams says we must get underway at once, like right now, because we are at this crossroads. And, and like you said, he starts it off by saying, man, if you look at what's happening, right, the view from the bridge is that things aren't looking good. All this marching, singing, dancing, praying is, is a dream state that we're in. And that dream is based on, on, on white people's sense of justice meaning that we're kind of waiting on white people to, to recognize injustice against us and, and, and replace it with justice. Now, the view from the bridge is, toward, like, like you just said, is towards the end of the book. But before that, at the beginning of the book, uh, Chancellor Williams talks about, I believe it was seven, maybe eight um, questions that he had and I'll, I'll start it off, and then maybe you'll, you'll recognize what I'm talking about. He said, uh -huh. like, one of the questions he had when he started this work is, how did all black Egypt become all white? Number two was, what was the process of blotting out the achievements of the African? Number three, how did African uh, invent writing, then lose it completely? Number four, is there one African race or people? Number five, if one race, why so many languages, cultures, tribal groupings, etc.? Number six, is there, is there a historical reason for black disunity? That's an interesting question. Number seven, how do you explain blacks' undying devotion to Europeans and Asians? And... Like I said, the book itself is a great read, by the way. Anyone who's listening to this show should go out and purchase the book immediately. You could use the affiliate links on 
the Bitter Medicine Podcast website, as well as our social media. Um, it's a great read, but like I like I said, um, it gets monotonous because it's the same tactics. Whites, uh, the Europeans and the Asians, white Asians, etc. These guys had the same tactic done over and over and over again. And so I didn't want Carl and I to spend hours here talking about the different um, kingdoms that fell. You know, we could talk about um, what are some of the kingdoms he mentions. He mentions um, um, the Maasai Kingdom. Yeah, Ethiopia, uh, Moro, Memphis, Mali, Ghana, Songhai, Timbuktu. And he mentions the Maasai in an interesting way. And we could talk about that at some point, too. But the Maasai was a group that understood fundamentally, once you see that white man in your country, you're doomed. Uh, but, but we'll yes. talk about that soon. So the first question, Carl, is how did all black Egypt become all white? Well, um, first, it was a result of uh, the Egyptians. First, geography, for one. Uh, the uh the desert in Egypt allowed for people to integrate into the country. You know, the Egyptians allowed foreigners to come into their land, Mm -hmm. and eventually they took over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they not only... And and the thing about it is um, the Egyptians, or I I should say the white Asians, because Chancellor makes note of there being white Asians, right? And I know a lot of people don't think about that. But these white Asians, in fact, the Bible even talks about some of these groups when they call them the um, the Hebrews. Uh, these folks came in and presented this notion of integration to yes. people. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? We hear integration all the time. And we know now because we're more sophisticated than our ancestors to some degree, we know now that this integration um, it comes at a loss to us. And so, Carl, from what I remember reading, and it's mentioned numerous times in the book, um, we allowed integration to occur. We adopted this philosophy from these white Asians, uh, these Hebrews, for those of you who are biblical in nature. And... Um, We took that to mean, you know, uh, it's okay for our women to marry their men and to have children and this, that, and the other. But what happened, and maybe it was something unforeseen, but the children of those couplings became the downfall of Egypt, Carl. Yes. Yes, because once they identified with the with the with their father's people instead of their mother's people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Identified so much so that they even look to destroy their mother's people, and and that brings about an interesting thing that we deal with today. We hear about the swirler, the swirlers, and the swirling community, and uh, how they're promoting black women to lay with um, white men. But it's also true of black men laying with white women. You make these these children, and something a lot of us don't understand is children understand they could recognize the winning side. If you ever observe children when they're playing and they're going to do something that's like team-based, they want to be with the other kid who they recognize as a winner. Have you ever noticed that, Carl? Of course. They always I've been want to that be, myself. yeah. They always want to be on the winning kids' team. Think back, those of you who play basketball or, or team sports or what have you. Think back to days on the court when you were a kid. There's certain kids you wanted to play with, you wanted to be picked by or to pick them because you recognize that they can win. I stand at about six three, close to six four. I I, I used to have a friend who stands at six seven. My oldest son, when he was one years of age, um, I was holding him in my hand. That friend of mine who's 6'7 came up. I said, hey, say hello to uncle so-and-such. And And my kid looked at me, looked at the top of my head, looked at him, looked at the top of his head, 
and he recognized that that guy is taller than me, he wanted to go to him. You see what I'm saying? So <laughs> we understand fundamentally the side that's winning, the side that's the power, the side that's the so-called elite or whatever. And we like to play on that team. And so what happens is, in Egypt's history, those mulatto children, which Chancellor Williams addresses later on as the mulatto problem, which I'm sure Carl has notes on, uh, those mulatto kids identified with their father's homeland and detested their mother's homeland. And Chancellor Williams points out something, Carl, that's real interesting. He says, you know, with that kind of mixing, you're going to have light-skinned kids, and some of them were so light, they just denied being African at all. Yes. You know, so yes. that's interesting. And also, I'll, I'll, I'll just add this one last thing, and I'll, I'll let you um, continue. Uh, what I found interesting is um, in America, we're taught of the one drop rule that says that you're black if you have one drop of black blood in you. But right. in Egypt, that's not, what, that's not how those Europeans and Asians did it. You were white if you had one drop of white blood in you. And you only were demonized or mongrelized if you show that you were pro-black or pro um, or pro-black or anti-Eurasian, that's when you became a, a vile. Uh, what do they, what do they call you? Mixed breed. So you see the psychology that's played on the African in America. There's one psychology um, from from Europeans in Africa. There was a different one, and both seem to have been effective. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, it really, it also further served to destroy what, what uh, Chancellor Williams said is the most, the greatest threat that the white, that Europeans perceive, which is black unity. Yes. And if you can undermine that unity, if you can have us at each other's throats, then they're free to come in and do and wreak the havoc that they have done so frequently throughout the centuries. That's a good point, Carl. I mean, like you said, Chancellor Williams says that black unity equals black power. And so disunity equals no power. And that's what yes. we're going through right now. We're going through a period of no power because we have no unity. Carl, as far as that question goes, how did all black Egypt become all white? Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add to that? Well, also, it was a successive invasion. So we, can't, we can't leave out the fact that Egypt being the, the jewel, the, the center of the world almost, you know, mm -hmm. that it was consistently, he had invaders from the Hittites, the Persians, the Assyrians, the Greeks, and it was, it was just constant. And I think something that we have to realize is that black African people only put up sporadic resistance mm -hmm. when it comes to the European, whereas their attacks are relentless. Yeah. So we're really dealing with a reality that we fight back only when threatened. And once we're done, you know, we go back to our peaceful life. Mm -hmm. Whereas the European is war ready at all times. Savage. So, yeah, we're not, we're not really dealing with them. We can beat them, but the reality is once we beat them, we consider them beat. And I guess we attribute to them a certain level of humanity that we have. Okay. We're beat. We raise war. Now we go home and that's it. But it's not like that. We don't understand that they're not, waging war just for the battle to be over and once it's over you're done no it's a continual a state of perpetual warfare that we don't understand what we're dealing with mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the early africans uh were you know naive to that but with time they should have recognized it present day africans should be quite aware of it because we saw this with the beginnings of the dark ages the Dark Ages occurred because Rome fell. Rome was, even the Romans and everyone associated knew this. They knew that if Rome fell, there would be a period of darkness because the Europeans up in what's now Russia and Germany and all that kind of stuff were just savage, kind of mindless uh, people. And Romans knew that if, if that citadel that they built, copied from Egypt and Africa, they knew that if that fell, that was it. 
there would be no progressiveness. There'll be nothing. So even the Europeans knew that the the that other Europeans were relentless. Rome was fighting those wars for years. I mean, hundred maybe a hundred years or so, right? Yeah, all the way to the Vandals and the Goths and the yep. Visigoths and the yep. the Gauls and yes, yep. yes, the the Romans and their their efforts to hold off the barbarian tribes of of Germany and, and West Northern Europe. In fact, the a German a, a Roman legion was destroyed by those barbarians in that area, mm. and it was considered to be off limits, and that helped lead to their demise. Once they started adding those barbarians into the ranks of their legions. And their allegiance was 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 some timey and wishy washy. That that's what led to their demise. Yeah, and so you listening to this show today needs to understand that you're dealing with a you're dealing with a uh, a savage beast that has no give up to them. They're persistent, and like Carl said, that's what really. In addition to the mulatto problem that we'll discuss and the the fact that we are too kind, and you know, because the African, even Chancellor Williams breaks it down, the African was a peaceful person into farming, into art, into, you know, you know, um, agriculture, you know, just into like living day by day, right? Whereas the, the European was a, a, a warmonger who always sharpen their iron on other iron. In other words, they were always fighting. And so that's what led from all black Egypt to all white. And it wasn't, like Carl uh, alluded to, it wasn't overnight. It was gradual because when you read the book, you read that there was only a quarter of Egypt that was taken over by these Europeans and Asians. And that over time, the blacks from the south of Egypt were always... um, Reengaging in 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 conflict with these whites to take back Egypt, right? Yes, yes. Uh, we are, in particular they mentioned the twenty fifth dynasty, mm. which was seen by the uh, Egyptians as, as liberators, and um, they were they would come in and they would free them from the oppression they were facing. I think it was at the time it was the Persians that had taken over Egypt at that point. Mm. So they were looked at. They were seen as, hey, these people are freeing us from our enemies and trying to free us from our over, from this overall system that we've been trapped in. So the, the, uh, the 25th dynasty, and this is something that a white Egypt, Egyptologist referred to it as an astonishing epic of nigger domination. Hmm. So it's, it's, uh, it's very telling that this, that they look towards the South for their freedom and for their liberation from their conquerors. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, nothing happens overnight, man. It's all gradual, but it it it, it also it's not all on the invader. It's what you allow the invader to do too, and that's yes. the lesson yes. that we have to learn. You know. Yes, it was a war against not just the people, but it was a war against their culture as well. Mm-hmm. And speaking of that. The next question is, what was the process of blotting out the achievements of the African? Well, one thing was, first of all, to wage war on the African people's culture. Um, You had to make their culture to be inferior and yours superior. Mm -hmm. You have to to make the African feel as though they're less than. So they, they wage war on their history. They wage war on their their language and their their names and their their uh, their very self. Even today, we we consider many many of us here consider African religions to be witchcraft. Yep. When these religions out are uh, older than Christianity, older than anything that was brought to the continent. Islam, yep. Islam, yes. So, but yet their beliefs are considered to be right and true. I believe it was Dr. Khalil Muhammad who said that they gave they when during slavery they didn't give us good food, mm-hmm. uh, good treatment, but they gave us good religion. Please mm-hmm. ask yourself that question. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, I think what Chancellor Williams gets at in this question from his research is um, the white man brings Christianity, 
right? The European brings Christianity, and the white Asian brings uh, Islam. And what happened with a lot of Negroes, and you see that still today, which is crazy to me. In 2018, you still see this. Negroes take on the, the names of Arabs. And, and so you've completed the domination because now you've taken on the names, the custom, the ways, the religion, culture, and you've, you've completely gone away from your own. And a part of that comes from losing battles. I think in the book, Chancellor Williams says something that I've always known to be true. If you lose to someone, you then start to, start to question what is it about their ideology that made them beat you. And so to, to save face and try to build up your esteem, you then study their ideology, the person who beat you. Chancellor Williams didn't say it quite that way, but that's essentially what it is, right? You lose to these groups, and you start to think, oh, it has to be their way of life that's better than my way of life. That's why they were victorious over me. Right, Carl? Well, I think that some of the African people may definitely have come to that conclusion, unfortunately. Um, also, I think there was the violence that was all such a, a huge part of the the Europeans and the Asians. It was, hey, you either believe this or I'll kill your whole family. Yeah. So I, I don't also want to say that it was, they felt it was superior, because in many ways they felt like it was superior. We still deal with this today. Yeah. There's an epidemic of, of uh, people who are bleaching their skin mm -hmm. because they want to be closer to the European. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we this is something that we really do have to deal with, is that we have been indoctrinated to see their ways are superior through the force of their, through the force of their weaponry and just through their sheer brutality. And don't doubt the sellouts and the coons too, because uh, oh, don't get right, me on right now we got uh, this dirt bag black China. I mean, just her name alone is a dirt bag, right? This dirt bag black right. China. I saw something the other day on social media saying that she's heading somewhere in Africa. Nigeria. She's no. going to Nigeria to sell bleaching cream. Oh my God! I mean, need need I say more? <laughs> you know what I mean? Need I say more? Right. And if you're African right. buying that shit, kill yourself too. Because you, you, I mean, come on. But this is what we're dealing with. You know, and you're right. You're yeah. right. I, 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 I uh, in no way, and this is for the listeners, in no way do I ever, got, uh, do I ever want you guys to think I'm taking uh, Europeans off the hook. That's never the case. I do believe in black excellence. I do believe that we can counter a lot of what they do. I believe that we can do better in some areas of life, even in, in the face of the systems of oppression that they place on us. But I'm never going to take, take the onus off of them for what they've created. Okay? Just saying that uh, before we go forward. But again, the question was, what was the process of blotting out the achievements of the African? And Carl hit the nail on the head with a few of those things. I mean... You know, once you bastardize the children, and by the way, the children that were bastardized by these Europeans and these Asians were from the royal lineage, by the way. So, but it wasn't just from the royal lineage. They were doing it with regular folks. They had concubines who were African and stuff like that. Shame on the Africans for doing that stuff. But also what helped blot out this history and also helped answer the first question which was, how did all black Egypt become all white? Um, blacks had to flee. You started to become dominated to the point where you had to flee. In Egypt, um, where, black, where, where we all come from, and that, that's one of the beauties of this book, if you're not paying attention when you read it, understand something. The black man, black woman, is from Egypt originally. It, this is not some hotep corner talk, <coughs> you know. No. This is real. No, I think, yes, and I think that he does a really good job be, as saying because the European looks towards Greece 
uh, as their foundation for their culture. Yes. Um, you know, we have, when you have um, fraternities and sorority, they use, they use Greek letters. So the Greek, Greeks, Greece is really the, the birthplace of so-called Western civilization. And it's understood that that is where their ideals came from. So just as though Greece is the centerpiece for their uh, civilization, so should Egypt be considered to be the source of African civilization. In reality, the Greeks received their knowledge from the Egyptians. Absolutely. The Greeks uh, traveled to Egypt. Uh, in school, we learned about, you know, Pythagoras mm -hmm. and uh, the Pythagorean theorem, but in reality, he picked that information up from Egypt. Yep. All the great Greek philosophers, Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, they sojourned in Egypt and got their knowledge from the ancient Egyptian mystery schools. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, your so-called Greek philosophy or philosophy. And in fact, I think I posted this on social media recently. Um, the word philosophy is African in nature, right? Yes. So uh, all this talk about, you know, the school of thought and stuff that came out of Egypt, that actually came, that was copied from Africa. And so when we had to flee from, from Egypt, um, we spread out into Africa. And that's a very important thing to understand. All these different peoples in Africa you see, the origin comes from Egypt by way of Ethiopia. And they were able to blot it out because once you, once you abandon the premises and new ownership takes over, they change it into their image. That's just fundamental, Right. right? They they, right. they they make it their image, you know. Like, if you talk to someone from the Bahamas, you have to remind them that there were Arawaks there before we came there, you know, because we think of it as as always our homeland. No, there was a people there before; they were just exterminated, you know. So <clears throat> that's how you kind of answer those two questions, Carl. Is there anything else you'd like to add to what was the process of blotting out the achievements of the African? Mm, the only thing I, I would really say I could add to that is that these these things, what they've done to where they've taken African people's legacy and denied it, has really gone to an extreme level. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes I think it borders on the absurd mm -hmm. to where they say, well, you know, now the ancient Egyptians could never have built pyramids. It was really aliens mm -hmm. who built it. So... It, this, and when you look at African artwork in, in West Africa and Benin and areas in there, oh, that couldn't have been Africans. That was built by people from Atlantis. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I really think sometimes these, these attempts to destroy the, the legacy of African people are, are almost absurd and laughable at this point. But yet it never ceases to amaze me how many people will, who hate Africa, who have believed and internalized all these negative things, will buy into these crazy beliefs. It's, it's just amazing to me. Well, you know, the problem is um, if you repeat a lie lo long enough, everyone begins to believe it. You know, yes. even the person who's who initially told the lie. So what has happened is that we because we live under the system of hegemony where whites are protecting their, their domination, the education system supports whiteness, politics supports whiteness, you know, geology, ge ecology, evolution, all that supports whiteness. And so while it's absurd for those of us who have awoken, right, it, 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 it's not absurd when you look back at where you come from. Right. Haven't been asleep. Right. You know, we we trust our teachers to teach us. Right? right. And so if our teachers are giving us a miseducation, well, we trusted them to give us that miseducation. And now we trust in the miseducation. And, so that, and that's yeah. fundamentally our problem as African people, as black people. We trust that we were taught the truth. Uh. And the fact is, we got to get off of that. We weren't taught the truth. You have to now find the truth. Listening to this show will give you that. Um, that last question again was, what was the process of blotting out the achievements of Africans? Um, 
Chancellor Williams also mentioned something interesting. This is the last point I have for this question. Um, He mentions how, like I mentioned before, if you were black with a drop of white blood in you, they considered you white. And so in history, what Chancellor Williams points out is that you have to look very keenly at, at the names of the people that they use. And you realize that some of the people, they try to just, by default, make them white. They're actually black. Mm. And he also mentions that the only time they, they differentiate from that idea that one drop of white blood makes a person white is if you are pro-black mulatto or anti-Eurasian mulatto, that's when they give you the vile you know, uh, mixed breed designation. So that's a part of how they did it, too. They took all the great characters of black people in history, and they just made them white. They didn't yeah. care what, they didn't care what, 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 what facts were written on the walls. They just made them white. And speaking of being written on the walls, uh, when you read the book, later on in the book, Chancellor Williams talks about how <clears throat> they were throwing away statues like crazy. Right? Yes, they have to. Yes. Yeah, they had to. They were throwing them away like crazy. Because for some reason, I, I, and I wasn't certain about this, maybe you can help me and the, and the listeners, Carl. Um, it seemed there was a point where Africans were portraying themselves kind of with a European look. Was, was that right, or did I read that wrong? Uh, I also picked that up as well. They they started uh, painting themselves because that that probably I would say as we talked about in the last book that that may have been a result of the uh, the menticide yeah that that uh, unfortunately we have all been subjected to at, at some point living in this in the system um, this is an early example of it you know you cease to identify with yourself and identify with your oppressor look look at uh we can see that today. Yeah, yeah, Kanye West. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's crazy that that happened, but that's also how they blotted out your history as well as Africans. Um, question three, how did the African invent writing then lose it completely, Carl? Well, uh, this was a result of the constant having, constantly having to move, constantly having to be under assault. Uh, the relentless wars that the African people were subjected to. Remember, we were saying how our our response is only sporadic, whereas with the European, it's it's constant. It's a constant state of warfare. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is basically African people on the run, trying to basically survive. And when you're just trying to survive, when you're just trying to figure out where your next meal is coming from, mm-hmm. you don't really have the, the luxury to... Of, of, the high arts, the high culture. It's all about the um, the hierarchy of needs. You know, mm-hmm. you got to have food, shelter, and clothing first before you can do anything else. Mm-hmm. So yeah. this is the result of the uh, relentless attacks. And one of the states he mentioned in here, you know, he talks about how even though the Africans defeated the the Europeans, the I'm sorry, the Arabs, they came back 600 years later. Yeah. So it was never a situation where they never accepted their defeat. They were always going to come back. Mm-hmm. It just took them 600 years, but they, they were back. Yeah, if you look at the history between Rome and Carthage, there's like three wars that happened there. And not yeah. back-to-back yeah. either. This is over over some generations this happened. Yeah, you know? hundreds of years. They, they took their time. They, they were going to take over Carthage, and that was their goal. They were going to take may have over. taken them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we may have taken them a hundred years, two hundred years, but that sort that sort of that that mindset, that perpetual mindset, perpetual war. African people do not have that to our debt to our. You know, that's a good thing about us, but it's also a bad a bad thing about us as well. Absolutely. Yeah, we are we are not warmonger, but you know, Chancellor says something interesting too. And this is why I want people to really listen to it in this moment. Um, Chancellor mentions how 
you know, we're not a, a, a warring people, especially when it came to these different groups. But there was a there's a bad thing about us is that we will hold a grudge against another African. And that's always yes. been the case. And later on, we're going to talk about that a little bit more when we talk about the disunity issue amongst Africans. Carl, let me take a quick uh, station break uh, and commercial break here. And on the other side, we'll answer the remaining uh, four questions, okay? Of course. All right. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. Black people face one problem. The problem of ignorance. This is why those who opposed us stole us from our parents disconnected us from our continent and enforced on us illiteracy. But now the ignorance is self-inflicted. We send our children to their machines. We detach ourselves from our motherland and we don't read meaningful literature. Consciousness is a series of stages. The sooner we get to one, the sooner we are ready for the higher. The pro-black compendium accelerates the beginner to the advanced and provides for the advanced an unparalleled breath. This is the sort of book your enemies do not want you to read, but our ancestors would insist you read twice. Peace Seeker, this is only from the pro-black perspective and we need power. Power will not be handed to us. We need to build power. But in order to build power, we need a power blueprint. You need to study the best blueprints available. You have Gardens. You have Wilsons. You have Williams. You have mine. Now, you'll have Cooks. Carlos A. Cooks was Garvey's best student. The greatest mind in the world from 1940 to 1966. Yes, the greatest. Yet, Whitey doesn't want you to read his blueprint. Cooks Blueprint isn't religious. Cooks isn't for integration. Cooks isn't for communism. Cooks isn't even for anti-blacks. Cooks Blueprint is for Africa. And Cooks Blueprint is the unknown blueprint that was the basis of black power as we know it today. When you say buy black, you're talking about Cooks. When you say black is beautiful, you're talking about cooks. When you say Malcolm got something right, you're talking about cooks. But cooks' blueprint was lost, and Whitey is hiding that blueprint behind a thousand dollar paywall. He's hiding solutions from you, telling you you need to take out a small loan to get the information that can liberate you. Whitey does not want you to have solutions to your problems, but you need solutions. You need power. I will give you the Carlos A. Cooks Reader, valued over $1,000 at a 98% discount, $15. Send $15 to cash.me slash dollar sign ABS Oni with the subject Carlos and your email address, and I'll send you the ebook. We need power. You need blueprints. Start building today. Greetings, family. This is Koku, host of the Bitter Medicine Podcast. In case you didn't know, 
we have an online book club called the Bitter Medicine Book Club. Every month, we will select a book to inspire the Bitter Medicine podcast listening audience to read along together. At the end of the month, we will have a call-in show and book discussion. This is a great, dynamic way for readers to not only enjoy a book, but also have others to bounce ideas off of. They say if you want to keep anything away from black people, put it in a book. Don't allow this to be true. Head over to bittermedicineblogs.com and subscribe to our newsletter for important updates. Do that today. Join our reading collective today and empower yourselves, your family, and your community. Peace and blessings. listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Welcome back to the Bitter Medicine Podcast. I'm your host, Koku, and I'm joined by Carl Hezekiah. Uh, we're discussing the book, The Destruction of Black Civilization by Chancellor Williams. Um, so far, we've answered three, or we've discussed three of the questions that Dr. Williams was looking to answer when he began his research. Just for you guys who uh, didn't know, this book was a product of 16 years of work. 16 years of work. Uh, I think I heard Carl say one time before that Dr. Williams had to sell his home to finish this yes. book, right? Yes. Yes, he did. So this is a very comprehensive work. It also goes back about three or 4,000 years before... Uh, the birth of Christ, if there is such a thing, right? So this is a comprehensive work. And so we couldn't do this review chapter by chapter, at least. We, I mean, we could have, but it would have taken hours upon hours to do. Uh, instead, we broke it down to, the, to answering or discussing these seven questions that Dr. Williams wanted to answer when he set out to do this work. Right now, we're on question number uh, four, but before I, I touch on question number four, two things. Number one, I want to add. Question number three was how did African invent writing, then lose it completely? Carl made the point, the excellent point from Dr. Williams that, you know, after the black man, black woman left Egypt, they were on the run. And they were constantly on the run, so much so that they didn't have time to develop or plan ahead and, you know, resume studies and this, that, and yeah, they were on the run, they were in survival mode. Also, the Europeans and the Asians, when they came into Egypt, they started adding their Arabic words and stuff like that. Um, I think the example Dr. Williams uses is Swahili. Swahili is filled with Arabic words. Right. And you'll hear certain Africans or certain uh, Africans in America who try to use more African terms, you hear them use terms that are actually Arabic in nature. And that kind of boggles my mind sometimes. But that's what happened to us creating language and writing. These folks came and they bastardized everything, not only the people, but the culture, the language, everything. And so that's why we completely lost it. We lost it because we were on the run. Uh, the yeah. And and uh, check, on on page one ninety three, uh-huh. uh, Dr. Williams says that he he mentions how um how millions who found security only in places of extreme isolation, uh, caves, swamps, uh, water holes. Mm-hmm. None of these people were fed with the chance even to begin the building of their lost civilization. Mm-hmm. But far from being ashamed of them as savages. This chapter is a salute to them, a salute with pride that says to them all honor and glory. Unlike the blacks we know most about, they could not build great kings and empires. Many were far removed, even from the fringes of an advancing world. Yet they overrode these unceasing attacks of both death and hell and survived. What is more, they held fast the last line of freedom on the African continent. And they held it against cannon fire to the very end. Even when colonialism swept over the land, they were never conquered. 
they had been wise enough to see both Islam and Christianity as just another route to the slavery they had fought and died to avoid. They remained steadfast in their own religion and therefore were called pagans. But all of their children were born free, none in Muslim and Christian slavery. And their girls were never dragged off to become slaves in the harems of Arabs or as breeding girls for white men in the West. I think that is a real testament to this. Even though they were denied their ability to rebuild their lost civilization, but they chose freedom and death over to white enslavement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, so, are, and, we are powerful. Yes, that's very deep. Yeah, and one other thing I want to mention on page 185, he says that the overall hum humane and essentially religious attitude of the blacks that the historian Arthur Toynbee to say that, if, Arnold Toynbee to say that mankind may have to emulate them if civilization is to be saved. This is hardly a compliment in a world where the very meaning of civilization is lost. In the face of the Caucasian will to power and domination, this religion of meekness is a tactic surrendered to the permanent overlordship of the aggressive and the strong. This is a testimony of history. And perhaps this is why I have always been puzzled by the declaration of Jesus Christ that the meek would inherit the earth. Did he mean the grave? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that right there really is a testament to what, to how we were saying how we lost our civilization because this, this religion of meekness that, that we have. Hmm. Carl, we're at the halfway point of these questions. I wanted to ask you, um, what what items in your notes did you have um, in the first half of your notes? What items did you have there that we didn't touch on? Uh, we really touched on mostly everything. Okay. Um, I I really didn't. Th yeah, we didn't really miss anything uh, that I had written down. Okay. Uh, I I know that he mentioned uh, the like you mentioned the development of right, but we can definitely go on to the the next couple of questions, because we've really touched on everything. Okay. We're on question number four, right? Yeah, we're going into question number four. And uh, before I say question number four, I just want to add something for you guys out there. I, I want to sh sh point out something Chancellor Williams says. I hear it all the time from pro-black folks to, to not take heed or listen to white words. Um, Chancellor Williams shows you that in order to study the African, you have to study the European. Because what Chancellor broke down was very interesting to me. He said some of his research came from reading like um, journal entries or paragraphs from Europeans who might mention the name of a king or something. And that's how you were able to kind of piece together um, this, this patchwork, you know, this, this history, this patchwork history. And so I, I just want to say to you guys that don't be so anti-European to the point where um, you can't even learn anything. Because at, at, at the end of the day, our history was damn near erased because of these people. So within their history, they will let it slip sometimes, things you need to know. And so I challenge you guys not to be afraid of white folks. I posted something on Facebook a couple of weeks ago, and it wasn't an article that I wrote. It was an article from some other site. And the thumbnail for the article had a white woman on it. And I... <laughs> I remember that. You remember it, right? And I remember that. That was a mess. Yeah, and what was it? It was something about black women, and I, I asked... No, it was something about women. And I asked on the page, do black women see the same thing? I can't remember the topic now. But I was like, do black women, is this true for you too? And some black woman comes on the page, on that status, on that um, post, and starts talking about you asking a question for black women with a white woman in the image. And I was like, lady, are you so afraid of white folks that the, a picture of a white woman scares you off? From, mm -hmm. even, from even reading the article, because she hadn't read the article. It was evident from her right. first reply, she hadn't read the article. She just was on this attack mode. And this is what we tend to do. 
we tend to, um, what's the old saying back home? We tend to cut off our nose to spite our face. Spite our face, yeah. And it's ridiculous. You're going to have to read some Socrates if you want to understand African philosophy. Because they stole that shit from Africa. Absolutely. You can't be so afraid of white folks that you won't take the time to at least see what they're thinking about you is or see what right. they've written about you. You understand what I'm saying, Carl? I, I may get my um my pro black card revoked, but uh I'm going to quote a Chinese man, Sun Tzu, if yeah. you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. No. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained you will also suffer defeat. Hmm. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Hmm. Uh, and Carl jo- said that, and I mean, jokingly, he said, in fear of losing his black card, but we shouldn't have to be in fear of losing a black card for quoting something that makes sense that comes from someone else's tongue. You know what I'm saying? Or for, for using some, I- some idea that these folks have to see how it applies to us. That's the nature of study. That's the nature of critical analysis. What are these folks saying? How do we feel about it? Do we see it the same way? That's how you have to do study. And Chancellor Williams shows us this. And he's not the only one, but we're talking about his book, The Destruction of Black Civilization, today. So I felt it necessary to bring that up. Carl, question number four is, is there one African race or people? Well, uh... Chancellor Williams seems to think so. Mm-hmm. So he definitely seems to think that they are, that they, that we are all one people. Yes, and he he outlines it. He even mentions that you know these Europeans and Asians they called Egypt and Africa they called that um, the land of the blacks. Exactly. They fundamentally understood what Africa represented. It was the land where black folks come from. Yes. And, and um, so it, it was understood that e- if you understand what the book is telling you, we're all from Egypt. This is why I heard someone else say it too, and I can't remember who it is, but someone was saying the reason why like in the 80s and 90s you saw all this kind of Egyptology stuff around Uh, black folks in America especially, was because in your genetic memory, you remember that you come from Egypt. So when you hear a lot, when you see a lot of, you know, stuff from black folks pertaining to Egypt, you'll hear other black folks say, well, we we, we all went from Egypt. That's not true. We did come from Egypt and Ethiopia. Matter of fact, Egypt and Ethiopia weren't even really a distinction. Right. Right? We all are from that, that area. Yeah. That mm-hmm. would consider that to be, just like us, that we consider Greece to be the center of European civilization. Egypt was the birthplace of really, and I would say even now, Greek civilization is really an offshoot of ancient Egypt. So really, the European, their cradle was merely a, a bastardized version of what was going on in ancient Egypt at the time. Yes. Greece so is just a satellite is, it, of Egypt. Yeah, so European, here we go again, they're taking credit for the things that African people have done. They're, they're claiming that they were the ones who created these, these ideas and these structures. In reality, these ideas, these, these, these beliefs, these, the sciences, the, the geometry, the, the, the everything that came, from, came out of Africa, the Greeks really took credit for it, but it was the Africans who were the ones who... The Egyptians were the ones who were the uh, the source of that. There's a good book that talks about that stolen legacy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I um, did a show a couple weeks ago where I was talking about genetic memories, and uh, a listener of the show reached out to me and told me that on Apple Podcasts um, mm-hmm. they couldn't listen to that episode. I'm curious if others have had the same problem if you have had the same problem on your podcast apps let me know um so i could investigate why that is now 
if I put on my tinfoil hat for a second, I, I, I can understand why the so-called <laughs> powers that be wouldn't want people to hear that because you tapping into your genetic uh, memory is a big problem for them. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. It's a huge problem. Absolutely. And when you hear these whites and Hispanics and stuff trying to tell you you're not Egyptian, you're not from those people, that's bullshit. You are from those people. You are those people. And what happens is we were one race, but when, as Carl has pointed out on several occasions during this, this episode, when the, when the, uh, the attackers came, the Europeans and Asians came, we had to flee that area, and we splintered off into different groups and into different directions. And what happened over time is, uh, even though we had, we had a, a, a one constitution, right, for everyone, it, geographically we separated, we were in different environments, etc. We became different peoples, in a sense, right? But if you look at Africa, Africa is very connected in terms of culture, like, you know, when we talk about African, traditional African religions and Orishas and stuff like that, it's almost the same. It's just a different term, but it's almost the same. In fact, a lot of the languages are kind of uh, similar, right? Yes, absolutely. So, um, yeah, we were one race, one people, and, you know, because we had to survive because we were on the run, essentially. Um, and then even in the, 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 the separate little groups that we had, the little clans and villages, that there, there were times where people were able to bring those together and create an empire in certain regions of Africa. Um, but yeah, we, we became as if we were different peoples because of what had happened to us in Egypt. So... The, the next question, question five, asks, if we are one race, why so many languages, cultures, and tribal groupings? Carl, you want to take a stab at that? Well, again, I think it really goes down to the, the distances that people being split into different groups. You know, these people develop different cultures in, um, in isolation. But there's still a fundamental root, mm-hmm. um, you know, like you were saying, there's still an interconnectedness. Mm-hmm. Um, there the are different religious beliefs. There are some words that are borrowed throughout different um, different regions. Uh, the the ideas, certain ideas, are held in common throughout the entire continent. Yeah, when you see so Africans that, complain, when you see Africans asking, "Who has the better?" Uh, 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 Jollof, Jollof rice. Jollof rice. Yeah. <laughs> There's a reason for that. There's a reason why jollof rice is a thing in numerous places. You know, it's the same people. You just were in different places. Right. You know? um, uh, something I noticed, Carl, that was of interest to me, Chancellor Williams spoke about tribalism. And he spoke about tribalism in a very interesting way. Because when I think of tribalism, I think of tribalism in modern times. We have this tribalism going on now, where there's the continental Africans versus uh, Afro-Caribbeans versus Afro, African-Americans, sorry, not Afro, African-Caribbeans, African-Americans. And you have the African-Americans now following suit with this uh, DOS thing now, uh, what's the descendants yeah, of slaves right. and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so I, I've always, because I'm, I'm in the modern time, I've always seen tribalism as problematic. But Chancellor even says something interesting. He said tribalism, at least in the context of history for Africans, was a defense mechanism. It was a good thing, is what he kind of alluded to. When you had to run, when you had to run, um, you know, you had to become a tribe, and you had to kind of protect the tribe, etc. And so this is why you have tribalism in the historic context. Tribalism that we deal in now is more separation. I mean, we, we right. are in somewhat of a survival mode, right? We are in somewhat of a, of, of a survival mode, but we're not in that kind of survival mode, if you get what I'm saying. We're not running 
all across the world to try to find a habitable, a, a habitable space. We're in our spaces now. You know what I mean? And so right. the tribalism that we have going on now is that sellout type shit where we will sell out a whole group to try to get some, some crumbs from off of the table. But in that time, the tribalism, as what uh, Dr. Williams said, which was interesting, is that, yeah, we had tribalism because we were fleeing for safety. And so people moved in different tribes. So I, I thought that was That's an interesting change of things. Yes. Yeah. I, and I, I do. And also, too, but we see how that has been exploited by the African people because that the idea of, of tribalism has been exploited to keep, like yeah, you said, we are one people, but it keeps us out of, at each other's throats. It keeps mm -hmm. us just unified. So that, you know, even though that may have been a survival mechanism at the time and it, and it did its job at that point in history, but it's something that, you know, we have to, if, if it's not working towards our liberation, we may have to abandon that idea. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, that goes to the thing I always talk about. Um, sometimes I mention it in the Bitter Medicine Think Tank on WhatsApp. Uh, by the way, if you're an educator or someone who's interested in the education of our, our children and future generations and you want to lend your hand in terms of developing a, a uh, African-centered curriculum, reach out to me and I'll, I'll give you membership to the... To the uh, the bitter medicine think tank. Um, that's what we're working on currently. Um, but, um, you know, th that's why I always say we have to revise. You see, a lot of people will come and tell you, well, didn't Frederick Douglass give you a, a, a curriculum in his time? Yeah, okay. But we're in 2018 now. We got to yeah. revise and we have to, we have to review and revise an update, you know? So that's what we have to do. Tribalism may have been of use in that time period, but is it of use to us now? Not particularly. Not particularly. And then, you know, he does mention on uh, page 284, the foreigners wrote to intensify the disunity, to promote the suspicions and hatred that developed from it, and to check any dis dis tendency of movement towards unity among the blacks. Mm -hmm. um, and he's, he, he mentions it at the bottom of that page, this strategy of the whites is as clear and unmistakable today as it was centuries ago. It is an aspect of what I have referred to as a grand Caucasian consensus, yet blacks appear to be heedless of it. Hmm. Man. And still. And, 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 still. And they still are. That's crazy. Yes. Crazy. Carl, is there anything else you'd like to add for that question? Um... If, the, if it is one race, why so many languages, cultures, tribal groupings? Uh, Caucasian fears, he says on page 162, Caucasian fears about the possibility of blacks developing a sense of oneness and unity of action is deep and centuries old. Many subtle schemes are used to maintain divisiveness and with success. So I, we're not going to place all the blame because like you said, they were already disunified due to the from the grand migration, the forced migrations. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we also understand that there, the grand Caucasian consensus, the fear of unity, black people getting unity and sense of oneness and action has exacerbated the problems to this day. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll add to that, if you don't mind. Um, of course. The grand migrations was because of the Europeans and the Asians, right? Yes, and, absolutely. And then, and you see, this is, why, this is what I'm talking about. The Europeans and Asians reviewed what was happening and said, huh, well, they're migrating. We could use this. We could use this to further keep them apart because once they're uh, disuni disunified, we can take advantage of that. So this is why your strategy always has to evolve. You can't just say, okay, this is a strategy and you stick with that for the next however many hundreds of years. You always have to reassess where has the strategy brought us to, what can we uh, double down on, and what can we get rid of and improve upon. You see what I'm saying? Exactly. These Europeans and Asians understand that. Do you understand that, people? 
The people listening, do you understand that? It's time you start to understand that. Um, Carl, the next question is... <laughs> next question is a very interesting one. Number six. Is there a historical reason for black disunity? Mm, okay. Well, I will refer to page one, 317, Go ahead. Uh, where he says the black unity threat. No one seems to have noticed or understood the signals from the white world, signals which tell how tremendously important the whites regard any movement towards unity among the blacks. Hmm. Nothing racial seems to upset them more. That is why they insist on being in on any black organization or movement, either as financial supporting members or as advisors, observers, or reporter. To bar them from any exclusively all-black conference is regarded as something a little less than treason or some type of black conspiracy in the making. Unity among the blacks has been prevented for so many centuries that various mechanisms to keep blacks disorganized has been perfected in the Western system of race control. The white man is keenly aware of any of the tremendous power of any well-organized groups, but an organization of blacks on a scope that would represent the voice of black America would be a threat and a challenge not only to continue white domination of blacks in the United States, but also foreign policies and practices that affect the lives of African people elsewhere over the world. Right so what I think we need to understand is what is, what is, what is it that our enemies fear? Okay. So if I'm Lex Luthor, I know Superman is afraid of kryptonite. I'm going to get my hands on some kryptonite. Mm-hmm. All right. So understand that it is a threat of black people uniting with a sense of oneness and purpose that is feared most among the, the European, which is why they have, there's a historical aspect to that is because they understand that if we unite, then with the European being a minority on the planet, their, their, their reign is over. Mm-hmm. If you look at the, the situations where even right now, the, the wealth and the minerals that basically power the world come out of Africa. Mm-hmm. The majority of the gold, the majority of the diamonds, the electronics we use, the cobalt that's, that's in our computers and our cell phones, 80% of that is mined in the Congo. Hmm. If the African people were to gain control over their resources, that would bring the, the Western war machine to a screeching halt. Yeah. So the uranium that that powers nuclear weapons is mined in Niger. Not a, not Russia or wherever they try to make it seem like it's mined in no. Niger. In Niger, mm-hmm. which is in Africa. So understand that they under, they they know this. This is what they fear, and this is why they have taken many steps to keep black people at each other's throats. So when your beloved. Tariq Nasheeds and Yvette Carnell and <laughs> and my, my man Tone Talks. He really disappointed me with that. Too. I, I used to like uh, what's his name Antonio Moore. Is it Antonio Moore? Yeah, I think it's Antonio. I, Moore. I don't. Yeah, I, I didn't hear. What did he say? He was, he's talking at DOS nonsense too. Oh well, it's him and Yvette Carnell who are the champions of that. Oh. Uh, yeah, it's both of them uh, together. That that was a surprise for me. I thought it was just her, and then I realized, wait, Tone Talks is down with that foolishness too, and now they got Tariq Nasheed on board. So you know. You know it's, black it's, folks it's are always, going backwards. It's, it's, always, it's always stunning to me how we can come up with these ideologies. It's, what, it's like we're really sitting here arguing over crumbs from the white person's table yep. about the benefits that we get from our oppression. We're really, instead of working together to create our own system, we're going to fight over the affirmative action and a lot, who's being allowed to be miseducated in these schools hmm. instead of creating our own institutions. Who's being you know, these, allowed to be miseducated? I, I, I want you guys to listen to what Carl just said. That's so perfect. You're fighting over who's being allowed to be miseducated in these schools. <laughs> I mean, how dumb can we get? Yeah, because I, I know you're going you're gonna to bring that point. We're going to bring it home eventually. I don't want to skip ahead. But there's a fundamental fact that we're missing, that we don't seem to understand, that we're ignorant of. And I'm not going to, I'll let you bring that up in, uh, as far as dealing with our, how we, who we perceive as our enemies. Mm-hmm. 
we don't have that perception yet of who our enemy actually is. So we're we're fighting each other when we all have a common enemy. Mm-hmm. And for focusing on our enemy, we're, we're kept divided and against each other. I, I don't think there's a really there's a real true understanding of history if you can really think that African people from the Caribbean, African in South America, didn't contribute to the struggle for black people in the United States. Oh. It's not an isolated incident. We all have the same enemy. We all have the same conditions. So you can't be ignorant of history and not understand that black people in America benefit and we're all a part of the same struggle. Mm-hmm. There's right now there are there are, I would say almost genocide level proportions against black people in Brazil. In and how they're being murdered down in Rio de Janeiro and all those cities in there. Mm-hmm. And that's not separate from what we're going through where unarmed black people are getting shot down by the police. Mm-hmm. It's one and the same. They speak Portuguese, we speak English. Mm-hmm. It's the same playbook. Same playbook. Mm-hmm. The white people are united in their, in their oppression. But for some reason, we want to distinguish because your ancestors got dropped off in the Bahamas, I shouldn't ride for you. I shouldn't support you mm-hmm. if you're going through things. Mm-hmm. And we we really let those few Af- and I'm I'm well aware that there are some Africans, there's some black people from the Caribbean who look down on African Americans. I, I certainly understand that. Yes, and yes. I'm not giving them a pass. Mm-hmm. I'm not there, and the, but I'm not naive enough to think that that's the majority. Mm-hmm. That's I don't, the point. I don't think. That, yeah, I don't think that's a majority. I don't. I think that they may be louder than others, but I'm under no illusions to think that they're the ones. That's the way the entire group thinks. I, I'm not under that illusion at all. Yeah, I I agree with that, man. Um, and I'm Caribbean. I've been in those conversations where I've been trying to tell other Caribbeans, yeah, you can't look at it like that. This, that, and the other. You know, mm-hmm. you, you can't look down on Black Americans. This, that, and the, I've been in those conversations. Believe me. But I also understand, and I know history enough to know that, man, Africans and African Caribbeans were riding for Black Americans, man. I mean, absolutely. I, I wouldn't even get into calling names. I could call numerous names of Caribbeans yeah. of of Africans. Marcus were, Garvey. Yeah, <laughs> the guys are Jamaican. You know, uh, you know. So, so yeah. Um, this is the the foolishness that we. We tend to do, and, and Chancellor Williams makes a note of that in a certain part of the book. He says that, look, Europeans or white folks fight amongst each other too, mind you. Yeah. Some of the most savage shit, you and I have talked about this in the past, some of the most savage mm-hmm. stuff that a European has done has been towards other Europeans. Absolutely. However, it seems to be something innate within them when the non-European, a.k.a. the African, the black man, comes into the room, they know how to set all that shit aside. You go and call a, 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 a Ukrainian Russian and see the hell that they give you for that. They hate them. But let a black dude walk into a room with a Ukrainian and a Russian, they're done with that bullshit. Yeah. Same thing with the yeah. Irish and uh, who's it? Is it the Irish and the Scottish who have the ongoing fight? The Irish and the and the English and the English. The, right? Br- the, the British colonized Ireland for almost eight hundred years. Hmm. So this is and that's a lot longer than Africa was colonized by the Europeans, mind you. Hmm. You see, and so yeah, we've always fought. We've always resisted our oppression. Yeah, and so don't think that. You know, all white folks are just chummy and all that kind of stuff. Nah, they tend to dislike one another too across borders. But when it comes to they, when you come into the room, they're they're on code with one another, and that's what you have to understand. You see, and this is what Carl is kind of hinting at, and I'll talk about it more. But they they yeah. know how to identify their enemy. You don't. Yes, and this and this is what uh, this is what Doctor Williams called the grand. Caucasian consensus, the strategy for destruction, uh, basically, is seldom varied, giving added weight to my concept of a grand Caucasian consensus on matters concerning non-white peoples. So, 
he says this aspect is not on the d- discussion. It was also the practice of having white groups spread out over the country into the various provinces, heavily laden with gifts of goodwill and getting themselves attached to the courts of local chiefs as friendly advisors who were going to guarantee the security of the chiefs and their people while they were extending their power over other peoples. Hmm. Uh, so basically, they would get in good with the, the local chiefs and work to undermine them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Their aim was to provoke war between the blacks, pitting the gun-armed groups against those who only had shields and spears, and thus skyrocketing the number of captives for slavery from a few thousand into millions. So this this is, like you said, white people are at each other's throats, but when it comes to dealing with with non-white peoples, that's when the grand Caucasian consensus comes into play. You see that, I see that throughout history, being a, a student of history, you see how the Europeans go into places like in China, the opium wars, getting the Chinese addicted to opium in order to create a market for their goods. You, you see this, how they keep each other, people at each other's throats, so that way they can come in and whatever issues they might have, just thrown out the window when it comes down to dealing with the uh, non-white peoples of the world. Yeah, yeah, we got to understand that. I'll... These white skirmishes that we try to get ourselves into, stop doing that, st- that stuff, too. Stop stay out of that business. Stay out of that business, man. Stay out of that business. Let them destroy themselves. Stay out of their business. That's supposed to be a fundamental African strategy. Let them destroy themselves. Stay out of that, you know. Um, Carl, we're coming up on the last question. Question number seven. How do you explain blacks undying devotion to Europeans and Asians. This should be a good one. We, we, we've talked a lot about this answer, but Carl, lead the way on this one. Well, uh, I think we want to go back to Dr. Uh, Bobby Wright, Menticide. Mm-hmm. The, the, the attack of the, the mind itself. And Dr. Bobby Wright said that Menticide was the greatest threat to the, the black race. And I'm I'm kind of want to agree with him on that because we don't this book right here, for example, it's a it's a it's a heavy book, but he analyzes and he puts the history within its proper context. Mm-hmm. He doesn't like to romanticize the history. A lot of people and I don't, I don't like to use that word romanticize because I don't want to, you know, put people who love African history as though they're just falling back on some romantic um view. That's but true. the idea is that Something happened. Mm -hmm. Something happened. And we have to study what happened and why it uh, it happened and what we can do to prevent these things and try to reverse the losses that we've made. So when you you have to understand also, too, that the black people are under relentless psychological warfare. We're bombarded with images, bombarded with with from the day we're born almost. You know, we receive notice and image that we're inferior, we're less than, and we have come to identify with our oppressed. We have internalized these, these ideas. Absolutely. So it is something that, that's why we, we love, and you know, also our religious character, that's also something that is, uh, been taken advantage of. Mm-hmm. You know, many of my friends are, are very, very devout. And, you know, I tend to avoid the situation because I know that it's going to lead to an argument. But I let them know that the people who gave you this religion didn't even believe you had a soul to even save. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's made us docile and it made us identify and love the very people who hate us. You know, Carl, there's certain... Um there's certain codes of conduct, so to, so to speak, that white folks push on everyone. Mm. And sometimes we don't realize how detrimental it is. Like, one of them is don't discuss religion and politics, right? <laughs> yeah. The reason why they don't want you to discuss religion is because you will realize that, hey, in slavery, when it was illegal for someone like me and you, people like me and you to read... There was the Bible. Yes. 
You could go read that. Yeah. You know, and so, you know, another one of those codes of conduct is you don't discuss salary. Why do you think it is they don't want you to discuss salary? Because they want to be able to take advantage of you for doing the same job that they're probably paying probably a white person to do and paying them twice as much as you. Yeah. They, they don't, don't want, want you to discuss it. Exactly. Why, why are you making more than me? Exactly. So I'm doing the exact same work. We got to get off of this stuff, and we need to start discussing these issues or these items in life very openly and frankly amongst our people. We got to start talking about it. Um, you mentioned it. I, I, I think that was the number one answer for me. Religion. We wholly adopted these foreign religions, and Chancellor Williams gives a reason in some instances why we did so. You have to connect the dots. So after we had to run up out of Egypt, and we were scattered across the continent, mm-hmm. what we didn't talk about here, because it, it didn't really apply so much to any of the questions that we were, that we were answering, so to speak, um, Africa, there was a perfect storm. There was the invasions, but also the continent went through an ecological shift. Mm-hmm. What a lot of people don't realize, the Sahara Desert was a vast Greenland. In fact, I was watching a documentary a couple weeks back, and they were showing you that in the Sahara, there's these rock paintings that African people put up, pa- painted these images on the rocks, that tells you exactly which type of animals were roaming in that area freely. They showed you the stone, that when you hit the stone, it sounds like a bell. I mean, it really sounds like a bell, right? So they're showing you that, that that region was a rich region, but there was a, this, this ecological shift in Africa where what was good regions became wastelands. And so these right. Africans and who were fleeing ended up in some of these wastelands sometime. Go ahead, Carl. Yes. Also, too, this ecological collapse um, was also exacerbated in many ways by the by the Arabs. You know, they bring in livestock that would graze the land and yes. would destroy the vegetation. Yes. So these these uh, these these conditions of the desertification of, of North Africa continues to this very day. Yes. And there's you know some countries are trying to plant trees to prevent. The uh, the the desert from encroaching any further, but this is something that was exacerbated. I mean, the climate change, of course, especially around that time period of history. You know, the world got a little dry. It was coming out the end of the ice age, so that was something that happened. But it was made worse due to the the Arabs and their you know basically attack on the ecology of the African continent. And so what happened with a lot of these African groups, they were suffering. And they wanted, especially like in West Africa, he talks about it. I forget where it was. I think it was uh, the Congo. He talks about how, um, you know, the, the people were suffering and looking for a better life. And here comes Whitey now with their religion. Right? Talking about the kingdom of heaven and all this kind of stuff. And so a lot of those black folks were like, well, damn. That sounds good to me. Where do I sign up? Yeah. Yeah. Can I, can I go to this kingdom you speak of? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So the African and the ancient African dealt with the, uh, how did um, Chancellor put it? He, he said he, they dealt with the white nature and nature. So the nature of conquest and nature itself. The African was dealing with very bad climate at one point. A lot of these groups were. Right. And so because they wanted something better for themselves, because in the genetic memory especially, they remembered coming from something great. When white folks came by, they thought, well, maybe these guys have something better for us. And so that's why, in part, I believe, why Africans or blacks have this undying devotion, because it's tied into that spiritual nature that Africans always have. In fact, when we talk about Egypt, we usually talk about temples. Every time they talk about Egypt, they talk about a temple. Because that's who we were. Temple life was central to what we did. 
Right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It was, I believe it was the Greek historian Herodotus who said that the Egyptians were the most religious people in the world. The most religious people in the world. You see what I'm saying? And so when these and guys... That's why came, I know they were African. I know we were black. I know we come from Egypt. Of course. There's a church on every street corner you see. Uh, right now. Right now, there's two churches next to each other. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that's how bad it is in our, in our um, society. So that was a big deal, man. Um, Carl, I'm going to take a commercial break. On the other side, since we've answered the seven questions... I just want to make sure that I cover the topics that you wanted to cover. We're going to talk about some more or less miscellaneous things throughout the book that was of interest, of note to to either you or I, okay? Okay, sure. All right, hold on. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni inviting you to listen to the Pro-Black Perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. Black people face one problem. The problem of ignorance. This is why those who opposed us stole us from our parents, disconnected us from our continent, and enforced on us illiteracy. But now the ignorance is self-inflicted. We send our children to their machines. We detach ourselves from our motherland. And we don't read meaningful literature. Consciousness is a series of stages. The sooner we get to one, the sooner we are ready for the higher. The pro-black compendium accelerates the beginner to the advanced and provides for the advanced an unparalleled breath. This is the sort of book your enemies do not want you to read, but our ancestors would insist you read twice. Peace seeker. This is only from the pro-black perspective, and we need power. Power will not be handed to us. We need to build power. But in order to build power, we need a power blueprint. You need to study the best blueprints available. You have Gardens. You have Wilsons. You have Williams. You have mine. Now, you'll have Cooks. Carlos A. Cooks was Garvey's best student, the greatest mind in the world from 1940 to 1966. Yes, the greatest. Yet Whitey doesn't want you to read his blueprint. Cooks' blueprint isn't religious. Cooks isn't for integration. Cooks isn't for communism. Cooks isn't even for anti-blacks. Cook's blueprint is for Africa. And Cook's blueprint is the unknown blueprint that was the basis of black power as we know it today. When you say buy black, you're talking about Cook's. When you say black is beautiful, you're talking about Cook's. When you say Malcolm got something right, you're talking about Cook's. But Cook's blueprint was lost. And Whitey is hiding that blueprint behind a $1,000 paywall. He's hiding solutions from you, telling you you need to take out a small loan to get the information that can liberate you. Whitey does not want you to have solutions to your problems, but you need solutions. You need power. I will give you the Carlos A. Cook's reader valued over a thousand dollars at a 98 percent discount fifteen dollars send fifteen dollars to cash.me slash dollar sign abs only with the subject carlos and your email address and i'll send you the ebook we need power you need blueprints start building today
Greetings, family. This is Koku, host of the Bitter Medicine Podcast. In case you didn't know, we have an online book club called the Bitter Medicine Book Club. Every month, we will select a book to inspire the Bitter Medicine Podcast listening audience to read along together. At the end of the month, we will have a call-in show and book discussion. This is a great, dynamic way for readers to not only enjoy a book, but also have others to bounce ideas off of. They say if you want to keep anything away from black people, put it in a book. Don't allow this to be true. Head over to bittermedicineblogs.com and subscribe to our newsletter for important updates. Do that today. Join our reading collective today and empower yourselves, your family, and your community. Peace and blessings. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Welcome back to the Bitter Medicine Podcast. I'm your host, Koku, and I'm joined today with special guest Carl Hezekiah from the Bitter Medicine Book Club. And we're discuss- discussing the destruction of black civilization by Chancellor Williams. Uh, Carl, in this segment, we're going to quickly talk about the things that we didn't talk about in the book, things that you have notes on, and uh, mm-hmm. things that I also found of interest. Carl, what's the first thing you want to discuss? Well... I think the most important, what is the out, what is, uh, I think, something that he talks about in this book here, uh, I think one of the most important things that he talks about is identifying who your enemy is. <laughs> and um, I think it's important that we, that we do that. Mm-hmm. And what he does is that he he points out this is not the ramblings of a uh, a wide eyed militant, but this is something that he has he has interpreted based on his uh, his studies mm-hmm. that he has um, he he is um, he brought this out. But he says that the compel- he says the necessary education on page one three ten. He says the necessary re-education of blacks and a possible solution to racial crises can begin, strangely enough, only when blacks fully realize this central fact in their lives. The white man is their bitter enemy. For this is not the ranting of wide-eyed militancy, but the calm and unmistakable verdict of several thousand years of documented history. Even the sample case study of 10 black states in this work shows that each and every one of those states was destroyed by whites. Hmm. Facing this reality does not call for increasing hatred or screaming and utterly futile denunciations. Because I think what happens is that we, we get information and then we just start reacting, we get mad, and it's understandably so. But he says that for all the emotional shouting outbursts by blacks are in themselves indications of weakness because they becloud the mind and prevent the calm and clear thinking that is absolutely required for planning if the race is to be saved from final destruction. Destruction is not too strong of a word. For only fools will be unable to see that the race is again being hemmed in, surrounded by its enemies, and cannot survive forever under what is called the state of gradual siege. Hmm. So, this is something that when he when he speaks of this, this is something that as a culture, as a group, they have been against us. We cannot ignore this fact. And I think it's very important that we look at that from a historical standpoint. Like he mentioned, every, every country he mentioned, from the Egyptians to the Ethiopians to the Sudan, Timbuktu, um, the Mosai, the Mosai had a prophecy that from the time that the country would be remain strong, but the minute that the first white man in their country would be doomed. Mm-hmm. And that was a prophecy they had. And, you know, we often, you know, hear about certain prophecies in the Bible or prophecies of King Arthur and his knights and finding magic swords. But when we, we don't understand and study African history enough that these people had, who had remembered, like you said, this generational knowledge, this knowledge transmitted their DNA, mm-hmm. they understood that, hey, once you let them in your country, it's a wrap. Mm-hmm. 
this is what the um, the Japanese understood during the the shogunate. They would it was a punishment by death to be a Christian in Japan because they understood that once you've been the missionaries, it's it's done it's right. after that. Mm-hmm. So they understood you gotta you gotta head this off now before it even gets to that point. So so this yeah. is something we don't understand. So I did a show. I just, I, you know, I say this almost every episode, but I did a show on Haiti on the 1804 revolution that mm-hmm. I, I demonstrated that the Haitians identified their enemies. They identified right. the, the Europeans as, the, as white people as their enemy, and they identified the sellouts and coons amongst them as the enemies, and they dealt with all of them. That's how they were able right. to be victorious. I also right. did a show... Um, talking about it from a business standpoint to show you how even in, in business you could you need to identify your enemy. If you don't identify your p- number one public enemy, you then start to identify villains within your own grouping. This happens in yes. corporate America. This happens in corporate anything, anything business. If you don't identify, if Burger King doesn't identify that McDonald's is its enemy, then Burger King is going to start having infighting amongst its own people and identifying right. them as enemies. You have to identify your enemy. Black people, I've said it before, Carl set it up earlier for me to say it now, your enemy is white folks. There's no if ands, or buts about it. Those are your enemies. There's no allies. Uh, yeah. Earlier, yeah. Carl, if you don't mind me saying this one thing before we go to your next point. Of course. Earlier, um, we talked about how these uh, Eurasians would wait 600 years and stuff and come back to, to conquer you. We talked about all the, um, the, the wars between Carthage and Rome over generations. I mean, generations upon generations, they had these wars. Uh, the thing about those Europeans in those, in those, um, in those instances, they identified their enemy, and their enemy was black people. Right. Dr. John Henry Clark used to talk about it. He said, in Rome, it was customary to greet a fellow Roman, you know, at the top of the day or whatever, and then identify, you know, reaffirm with whoever they, they, they're greeting that the African is the enemy. Right. Carthage <laughs> shall be destroyed. Carthage shall be destroyed. And that wasn't white on white violence. That was whites in Rome against blacks in Africa, in Carthage. You understand? So we, you have to, if you're listening to this today, I know it might be hard because you have the picture of white Jesus up on the wall. Um, you have that white basketball coach who likes to hug up on you and take photo ops and all that type of shit. I know it's hard. But you have to identify these people don't mean you, they fundamentally don't mean you well. Sure. There might be a bleeding heart Caucasian somewhere. Sure, there might be a bleeding heart Asian somewhere. Sure, there might be a white woman who's trying to choose up on you or something like that. You know what I'm saying? But understand that fundamentally, they care not for you nor your race of people. And you need to identify them as enemy number one. Carl, what other points did you want to bring up? Uh, even. If white people really want to do something, they really want to help the allies, then they need to go amongst their own racist family members right. and speak to them because they're the problem, not right. us. Right. So if you if you're a white ally, you feel like you want to, you feel like this is wrong, then you need to do your crusading amongst your people. We know what it is. You don't you don't see black people gunning down white people who are trying to stop uh, mass shootings, which happened twice this month. Mm-hmm. So this is a problem within your culture that you need to solve. And if that offends you, that means you're part of the problem. You're part of the problem too. You're part of the problem too. You know, fix your culture, and, and, yes. and then everything will be better right allow us to fix ours you know 
Yes. And then he says that on page 322, the obstacles to unity are so great that the outlook is both discouraging and frightening to all, but strong with the will to both survive and overcome. The very first major obstacle to be overcome involves a mental revolution out of which uh, black America faces up to the stark reality that white America as a whole is its enemy, that blacks will be recognized only in subordinate roles, that the scattering of black office holders high and low really mean nothing to the race as a whole, that there are actually two sets of laws administered, one for whites and one for blacks, just as there are two sets of wages and prices, and finally, that the blacks' loyalty and devotion to the whites, in spite of all they have done and still do against them, mystifies the whites themselves and confirms anew that their belief that such humble dog attitudes indicate inferiority, independent of everything else. So, white people, they themselves don't understand. After everything we've done, they still love us. We don't understand it. That They must be inferior. Mm-hmm. Because uh, people who were not inferior would not if you kick a dog enough, it will bite you. Yeah. On sight. But yet we don't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we have to be slow. You know? We ha- we have if you to let be, them tell it. Yeah, if you let them tell, we have to be slow. Right? Yeah, but you have to identify your enemy, man. You know? Uh, I was glad to see Chancellor Williams added that here. Um Carl, is there anything else you want to, to mention? Uh, no. Anything else you want, to, you want to mention? Yeah, there's something I want to mention. I, I thought it was interesting. Um, there's a part of the book. I, I didn't write too many notes on this book, but th- this one I had to write down because it stood out. Um, Chancellor Williams talks about, you know, what you talked about earlier, that we were, when you are people who are trying to survive, Right. And and when people Mm -hmm. keep you in survival mode, they know that by keeping you in survival mode, you don't have much time to sit down and plan for the future. And so we become synonymous with people who don't have a plan. And so what Chancellor Williams wants you to have to adopt is a plan. Um, And 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 he goes on to say, um, in short, certain conditions in a country can bring about internal peace stability, and confidence, which unshackle the mind. There is now time to think. No more trekking with bleeding feet for hundreds of miles across rocky deserts. No more seeing your kinsmen fall out and welcome death along the way. At home at last, better farms, plenty of food, and now time to think. This is what this is what the preconditions of progress are. According to Chancellor Williams, he says they include the people must become famine-free and be able to, t- to end their perennial roaming from place to place in search of food and water and settle down. Number two, having found suitable territory, the leaders must proceed through negotiations with other neighboring societies and fragmented groups to nation-building. Number three, There must be developed, and this is a crucial precondition, a sense of national community among the various language groups that make up the country. This is so important that it cannot be left to wishful thinking or chance. It must be programmed in such a way that a sense of loyalty and of being an important part of a great united brotherhood, which is the nation itself, will develop naturally. Four, a strong army of defense... Five, the reign of law and justice applying equally to all classes in the society. The people must feel absolutely secure as individuals and that in their country there is equal justice for all. So that stood out to me because what we need to do, what we, what we tend not to do, and we've had these blueprints for a while now. Marcus Garvey talked about it. I mean, so many people have talked about this. we got a nation build. The first things we got to do, um, Farrakhan talked about this in the last Million Man March. We have to start farming, buy land, farm, um, produce your own food. I posted a status on social media this week. Do you have 30 days of emergency food and water? Probably not, right? No. 
do you? No, I would say most people don't. Most people don't. Do you know how to till the soil? Do you know how to farm? Do you know how to how to camp? See, these are the things we have to we have to start in, um, ingraining in the culture that we have, right? Right now, Carl, you I think you and I have talked about this before too. Right now, most black folks, it's because we elect to live in cities, we are distant or distanced from the farmlands. We're not farmers. And we end up living in these places where there's, there are these severe, what they call food deserts, right? We're, right, absolutely. We're basically in famine. Because we're yeah, not we're eating fresh... The Popeye's chicken on the corner. That's what I'm saying. You know, in New York, it's Kennedy Fried Chicken on the corner. We, 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 we are almost in famine. And, and earlier in the book, um, and uh, who else spoke about this? We did another book review that talked about this too. But the malnutrition that Africans went through in history, we're kind of facing that now. Chancellor William talks about this malnutrition. When you were running away from these savages and you, you, know, you were in survival mode and the, the land was harsh, and you didn't have the you know proper nutrition. Some of your children were born retarded. So yes. so the, the the next generation of builders and stuff was depleted because of malnutrition. We're dealing with that right now. Absolutely, yeah, we are. You know, so we gotta we gotta come off of that stuff. We gotta learn to farm. And in fact, I've been thinking about making a course on on urban farming since we all tend to be in in these cities. A urban farming, a vertical farming course, because we need this knowledge. We need to start doing this stuff on our own and stop relying on the, the Koreans. I don't know how it is where you are, but in New York, most of the produce that black folks uh, could buy is from some Korean. You know, these Koreans open up these stores. If you're buying fast food on the corner, it's some Arab. So, you know, with these Kennedy fried chicken type, you know, KFC knockoffs, you know what I'm saying? Or the corner store bodega mm-hmm. or something. We live in these food farmers, but we can rectify that stuff by, by, by bartering crops amongst each other, by growing in our homes or, or, or creating these community gardens and stuff like that, which some people are doing. I'm not, I'm not saying that we aren't doing it at all, but we're not doing it in the numbers that we need I'm to not. be doing it in. Right, right. We're not. Yeah, so once you start to handle those basic needs in-house, that allows you to think more. And that's what I want to really get to. When you handle those things and you stop receiving handouts from these these folks who don't care about you and you start actually uh, producing things in-house, you have more time to think and plan for the future. And Chancellor Williams gives you a blueprint to organization. And, And we... We're going to end on that note because that's a whole show by itself. But it gives you a blueprint to what an organization should look like. Um, and, you know, some of the things he, he talks about, what, you know, you should have a Department of Promotion and Community Cooperative Enterprises, Department of Finance, Banking, and uh, Credit Unions, et cetera, et cetera. These should all be a part of anyone who's trying to start a black organization should go and read this book and, and then pay attention to this to the end of the book here where he talks about organizing, right? These are the things you need to keep in mind. But even before that, something very important he talked about, and Carl and I have talked about this before. You got to get out of this organizing around religion. What did he say? He said religion is one. Um, There was another one. I I just drew a blank. But he basically said it was three things. Damn it, I forgot. But he said you got to stop organizing around religion. Um, you got to stop organizing around, um, what was it? I want to say it was country. Yeah, I got the book. I, yeah, patriotism. P- patriotism? Okay. Yeah, something like that. But you see, um, that first one, very important. Last week, the Pro Black mm. Perspective podcast had a had a live discussion. Carl, I don't know if you caught it, but they had this live show, and they were talking about mis- misleaders in the black community. And the thing that you'll notice about all the misleaders they talk they spoke about are Islamic or Christian. 
<clears throat> because the truth of the matter is those lead these so called misleaders are leading from the vantage point of religion which we establish and many other people have established that religion hasn't served us. These right. Abrahamic religions haven't served us. So we got to stop organizing around, um, you know, religion. Well, also too, if I could add this, they don't really want the problem to be solved. Right. Because there's so many benefits they get from poor and suffering, unhappy people that if we were to really do take steps to really solve our problems, there would be no ties and often coming out every Sunday. No, we would have real concrete, real world solutions that, that exist in this world instead of waiting for the hereafter, mm -hmm. waiting for the by and by. So people like, you know, these, these groups that are, that are doing these things, they're not really interested in solving any real problems. Because that, that takes away their money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So basically, if we're going to organize, it has to be race-based organizing. Race first. Race right. first. He, he's a Malcolm X that leaves religion at home. He was a Sunni Muslim. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's absolutely right. So we got to leave that alone. Um, I feel like that was the last point I really had to make. Uh, Carl, is there anything left from you? Uh, no, no, I'm, I think we covered everything. All right. This was a good discussion. Um, again, it wasn't a chapter by chapter breakdown like we've done in the past because there's some difficulties with this book in doing chapter by chapter analysis or highlights. But I, I think we did do a, we did do a comprehensive uh, review of the book. And at the same time, it, it what we did was kind of Chancellor Williams' purpose for putting out the book, which is to give instructions on how you can go forward. Um, the one last exactly. thing I'll add, too, is Chancellor Williams said, we don't need communism. We don't need capitalism. We were fine without the two. All we need to do is get back to who we were back in Africa, back in Egypt, before we ever had run-ins with these other groups. Right. I would call it a form of African communalism. Yeah. Yeah, we got to get back to African communalism. And because we're outside of Africa, we have to be pan-Africanists. And that's what I want you guys to take away from this book and this discussion. Carl, once again, a pleasure to have you on. Carl, um, we kind of did, well, not kind of, we did this show late uh, because we next week we have to talk about uh, Kwame Ture and Charles Hamilton's Black Power, The Politics of Liberation. Of course. Looking forward to that one. Yeah, that's a good book, too. But can you, because uh, we already made the selection, can you tell the audience what we're reading in December? Oh, yes. We're going to be reading I Write What I Like by Steve Biko. Yes. Do you know? Tell me, who, do you really know about that great man, Steve Biko, right? So yeah, Steve we'll be Biko covering that book. On, he, can't, he couldn't be turned, you know. They, they had to kill him. Cause he, knew, he knew he would never bow. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, Carl, once again, thank you. Um, I will be talking to you soon. There's something else I want to ask you. If I could ask you here. Carl, have you ever thought about podcasting yourself? I have. I have. I, I don't know if I have time with a skill. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I have the time with a skill either <laughs> most <laughs> times. But, uh, yeah, I think uh, that's something you should think about doing. I think your book reviews and your book choices... Uh, I think will be a good, um, you know, a, a good thing to have and uh, that people could tune into and, and actually hear about other books that you and I haven't covered in the book club, but books that I know that you've read because I've seen you write blog posts about them and stuff like that. So something to consider. Thank you. for the, Thank you. That might be something I might consider doing in the future. Okay, then. Uh, until next time, guys. This has been your host, Koku, and special guest, Carl Hezekiah from the Bitter Medicine uh, Book Club. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe on YouTube or whatever uh, other platforms you use to listen to podcasts. And until next time, peace.
Thanks for listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast with your host, Koku. If you like what you just heard, we hope you pass along our web address, bittermedicineblogs.com, to your friends and colleagues, and share our show to all your social media. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. This has been a KWAZ radio production. Join us next time for another session of the Bitter Medicine Podcast. Follow us on Facebook at Bitter Medicine Show, Twitter, Bitter Meds, Tumblr, Bitter Meds, Instagram, Bitter Medicine.